I'm very happy for the invitation uh, because I would like to share with you um, a work that we did recently for uh, the Tallinn Architecture Biennale, uh, which took place from September to December uh, 2022. And I co-curated it uh, in collaboration with my friend Areti Markopoulou, um, who lives in Barcelona and directs the IAC Institute in Barcelona. So the title um, that we proposed was Edible or the Architecture of Metabolism. And this is what um, I'm going to share with you today. And we basically started from a simple question. When we consider something edible, we understand it, its capacity to be eaten, consumed, or ingested independently of its taste. If our contemporary relationship to the built environment registered such processes, what would our cities and constructed environments become? So the, the topic started uh, during uh, the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic, where the question of food and the empty shelves were, became a very important topic for, um, for everybody, especially for me here in the US with the question of empty shelves, having a family of young children. Um, it made us really think of a, of a topic to propose for the Biennale that would reflect on the fragility of our production processes, the mobility networks that transport commodities and food, and how can uh, these problems call for new forms of localization and the design of circular economies. In edible overall, we approached food both literally and metaphorically. On the one hand, uh, via food, we explored architectural strategies of local production and self-sufficiency, like urban agriculture and renewable energy. On the other, we analyzed the byproducts of urban life, namely livestock, agriculture, and forest residues as resources in ways that we may limit material loss and explore alternative pathways. The relationships between architecture and food are in many ways interscalar and interterritorial. They connect the stomach and our senses to the ecology of territories and the technology of building systems. They bring together the farm, the city, environmental inequality, and the stomach. Currently, the global food system from the overgrowth of chickens to the interiority of the agri-food industry is the world's second emitter of greenhouse gases. As the need for food continues to grow in response to increasing urbanization, the alienation between people and their sources of provisions also grows. We continue to produce and consume our edibles by reinforcing carbon dependency, often unaware of the links between sourcing, production, and distribution of food and the ways in which we consume it. In many ways, we are estranged from the journey of the edible arriving to our table. If we take this example, um, it's one of my favorite, the kind of growth of chickens between within the last 50 years, we see that the volume on the weight of chicken breeds grew about four times larger between 1957 and 2005. This fact makes evident that we raise and alter chickens to be turned directly into a food source as quickly and efficiently as possible. We have developed food systems that require the physical alteration of living beings to support the logistical machines of industrialized agriculture. So in the Biennale that I will um, very quickly present, we envisioned an architecture that produces resources, digests its waste and decomposes. This paradigm hopefully radically intervenes and recomposes the extractive, consumptive, and contaminating logic of the built environment. Within the context of many interconnected global crises today, the climate crisis, the public health crisis, social inequity, the idea of a world where resources may be recirculated is vital for planetary habitability. So some basic questions that we first asked were, how can we design the architecture of metabolism? How can architecture redefine resources, produce food, and also itself be eaten away? These are the words of um, Black Almanac authors, which I know have participated in the metabolic 
sublime, but I'm quoting them. Um, I find them very powerful. They say, by eating, we ingest the planet, and in turn, the planet becomes the repository of our excretions. So in many ways, this primordial relationship of interdependency is sensed via architecture, which in many ways provides the medium where resource consumption and decomposition, as well as body sheltering and micro micro climate change is registered. With the different thematic entities of the curatorial exhibition, we addressed three scales. The micro scale of materials from brick to soil is a name that we, um, we gave to that section. The macroscopic scale of large scale territories, which we called food and geopolitics. And the mesoscale of habitation, which we called the metabolic home, where domestic programs were designed as ecosystems in a feedback chain of reactions. The metabolic home, which was the center space of the exhibition, redefined the concept of habitation, urging visitors to participate in a curated experiment. There were seven installations, each of which was exhibited in seven rooms, and they all showcased how metabolic processes related to food are linked to everyday domestic spaces and activities. With the metabolic home, we were interested in the house as a microcosm of the world and a test bed for how resources could be recirculated. The house was in many respects an allegory to larger as well as smaller spheres of action, but also it is an intimate space that brings ideas on recycling and regeneration to everyday life. To build the house, we assigned different programs to different architects with a prerequisite that all parts, all rooms would communicate with each other, receiving the waste matter of other programs as input and converting it to resources as output. For example, the kitchen was the place of processing organic matter, while the garage was a place to upcycle leftovers of other rooms. So in, in this plan, you see a little bit the kind of programs that, that were linked to different kinds of metabolic activities. So producing food is presented in a vertical robotic garden, processing food in an interspecies kitchen, ingesting in a rewilded dining room, digested in a lounge with an edible outer envelope, hydrating in a toilet that continuously recirculated and filtered water, breaking nutrients in a vertical terrace for harvesting, upcycling in a garage made of carbon negative voxels. Each domestic space was part of a larger domestic ecosystem and interacted with other house parts in a feedback chain of resource reactions. The idea of the house as a regenerative system prompts this example by William Stumpf, which is the metabolic house that he designed in 1989. Um, and he was a Minnesotan designer who was invested in furniture design and ergonomics in order to explore energy efficiency and the local looping of water and bio waste. In his own words, he thought that our houses should have a digestive system like we do. And this principle was not rooted in biomimicry or uh, physiology, but rather in exploring alternative patterns for energy and for energy reuse and consumerism. So the portrayal, this portrayal of the house made of parts urges viewers to look at debris, the waste of our own production processes in many ways in a visceral way via the raw ecologies of our own bodies and the understanding that recycling is not just statistical abstract and disembodied. It cannot merely be relayed to the management of resources, but rather it lands on bodies and on the food we eat, the water we drink, and the air we breathe. We were also interested in the reconstruction of the house as a living machine that generates new spatial alliances between parts and programs, between kitchen waste and a bathtub, a toilet and a garden, a bioreactor and a bathroom. Such new programmatic and experiential alliances display reasons, modes, and trajectories 
for existential change. Habitation in this light is reconceptualized as a process of transferring and transforming spaces where dichotomies and distinctions like inside, outside, body, habitat, habitat and environment are systemically transfigured. To take a small historical turn, here we can see an example of early living machines. And we see here the Ark of Cape Cod, which was built by the group of new alchemists in 1976 in Falmouth, Massachusetts. The Ark was a miniaturized ecosystem for alternative food production, hailing from the belief that it could serve as a lifeboat of biological diversity and autonomy, many uh, like Noah's Ark in many ways, if the existing agriculture system on Earth would fail. The Cape Cod Ark was one of many arcs built by the new alchemists, most notably the Prince Edward Island Ark in Canada. And they were living communities and material test beds for the coexistence and interaction of diverse species as experiments for practicing year-round controlled agriculture, aquaculture, and passive solar heating. The goal was to maintain and calibrate the fragile ecosystemic balances of a contained livable interior environment in harsh climates and to sustain a small colony of people. The people that made this arc, John Todd and William McLarney, were marine ecologists. And they transferred the principles from wetland ecologies to inhabitable microenvironments um, and coined the term living machine. Architectural decisions were in many ways physical tools that enabled what they called a nourishing thermal mass that empowered productive associations between species, animals, and microorganisms. Architecture was understood by the group as the fusion of boundaries between organic and inorganic elements. The calibration and construction of a composite living world where, for example, bacteria would feed from the very material that articulated a boundary. This conceptual model for architecture was directly opposed to Le Corbusier's metaphor of machines for living and denounced the arc as a performative environment with corporeal measurable input and output. It was the group's intention to outline what they called a living form, one that would create spatial form and morphic order simultaneously. In their words, in defiance of entropy, energy could be harnessed to work on the side of life, or in other words, to design life anew. So going back from this to how the metabolic house was inhabited, in the opening, uh, we, we directed a performance with uh, performing actors of how different parts of the house would be inhabited and feeding um, one space uh, with the waste of another space. And here's a short video of this performance.
the greatest discovery was that um, from So what we discovered, which was um, really fantastic for us to see, is that uh, food is a topic that forges intimacy. It concerns everybody. So um, it's not about only intellectuals. It's about um, everyone that can participate in this process. It's a visceral um, project. So it becomes, in many ways, a powerful instrument for introducing questions of biopolitics and design. The proximity of the audience to the subject of the exhibition was evident in the opening, um, where after this performance that you just saw, um, everybody started eating everything that was in the exhibition um, and participating in the process of taking resources from one room to the other, as well as feeding themselves, engaging with uh, food um, and display. So it was not in any way, a typical opening where people converse in distance, but uh, one where groups engaged in cutting plants and herbs with special tools, scooping raw rice from the floor. And uh, this was a beautiful reminder in many ways that um, we eat the planet and in turn the planet becomes the repository of our excretions. Just to give you a little bit of information on the other parts of the different scales, um, this is the micro scale section from bricks to soil where uh, whose, whose aim was to magnify the significance of being aware of the origin, process use and destination of built matter. With a focus on the micro scale of materials, this section was a laboratory of experimental solutions for building prototypes and parts that are edible, upcycled, productive and compostable. Blurring the limits between natural and artificial, the projects presented were the outcome of programming, hacking, or adapting natural growth and harvesting processes with a goal to generate buildings and landscapes that produce food, become nutrients and food, and enhance biodiversity. So this was uh, one such installation from an Estonian group called Mycene. Um, it was called uh, Mycene Interface Organism. And uh, there are several projects with mycelium um, these days. Um, it is the root system of fungi and it is used, as a lot of you might know, to thread together various organic byproducts resulting in solid materials. These materials can seamlessly return to the cycle of growth and decay, becoming nutrients after their use. Um, so growth needs to be balanced with decay, which provides nutrients for new energy. In this installation, this was the part of the wall of uh, mushroom bricks that have died and have, are, were very solid, but there was also one part from behind where um, there was a capsule of uh, mycelium growing. So it was extremely moisturized and there were different stages of, uh, of this process displayed. This, uh, this project, was, which was part of a larger wall structure, was called Root Skin and was done by um, a team at IAC in Barcelona. And it, Root Skin consisted of a network of vegetable plant roots that created a perforated membrane used to filter light in buildings and public spaces. It grows on a wooden structure covered with a layer of soil to cultivate plants milled with a pattern um, wherein water percolates through soil deposits, guiding the growth of roots and defining the membrane's perforation configuration. In the macroscopic scale of uh, food and geopolitics, we engaged with large scale territories, planetary phenomena and bottom up territorial actions via maps, drawings, films, and visualizations of mass migration and food sourcing in challenging environmental conditions and zones of conflict. From local ground up material banks to cultural practices rooted in the land 
and food injustice by ecological transformation, food and geopolitics highlighted the interdependencies of food system, culture, political economy, and geography. And uh, this was the project Black Almanac, which you might have seen, because I know that Philip and um, Andrea are part of the metabolic sublime um, in different ways. Um, so their project was a speculative design research platform that sees artificiality and alienation and desire as key ingredients to the transformation of the food system. Uh, presenting a timeline in reverse from 2050 to the present and outlines 30 fundamental categories from infrastructure to genetics, culinary philosophies, marketing, and microbiology, crucial to the task of feeding a population of 10 billion in ways that may be equitable, nutritious, and sustainable. Um, so a lot of these terms that they used included neurogastronomy, flavor engineering, and post-farm food. And in a similar vein, um, Robert Charles Johnson, who's a designer and filmmaker from London, presented the project Fat Economy, um, which stands for the economy of fat, which is a design system for rethinking the value of fat and oil waste produced in commercial kitchens. Uh, he designed a hybrid system that intervenes in the traditional recycling process, uh, which sees the waste stream of oil and fats being transformed into biofuel, creating a close alliance between craftsmen, waste collectors, biofuel producers, chemical scientists, and local fast food chains. The project pulls together a community of differing specialisms to reimagine and consume cycles that enable different applications from the waste uh, streams. As a result, he made biomaterials that are created to replace plastics um, and also uh, speculated on the production of biofuel from fat. Other sections that were presented in the exhibition included the research section, the archaeology of architecture and food, um, which presented a minor history of the 20th century in a broader network of human, non-human, biotic, and abiotic factors that are implicated in processes of production, consumption, and decomposition. Uh, but mostly this history specifically focused on questions of biopolitics and decolonization, and particularly the role of women in places of labor, including the kitchen. The Future Food Deal, um, which is the final thing of the exhibition, was a curatorial initiative to imagine the future of food systems and urbanity in 2050. Um, we invited many participants that were posed questions related to food justice, species interdependencies, global political alliances, and obsolete infrastructures. Such explorations were encouraged through visualizations and expression of power dynamics who gets to benefit from ecological catastrophe, who does not, and what does it look like? So um, the future food deal, which included visions and cookbooks, confronted principles of kinship, interspecies alliances, circularity, and localization. In parallel with uh, the Talent Biennale, we curated, um, we edited an efflux architecture project on digestion and all of the texts from which are really interesting um, are online and available. Um, by digestion, we um, speculated on the waste products of a human's body digestive system connected to numerous treatment systems that allow it to be reincorporated into a wider ecological system to continue circulated. The waste products of buildings, however, don't do the same job. In exceptional cases, the landfills to which most former buildings are destined become new land. But thinking what it would mean to build a system capable of treating the food and the waste of a city itself, its building would entail nothing short of radically rethinking what it means to build a city as such. It would take exploring the way that agricultural systems, culinary arts, and digestive processes are conditioned by built environments and vice versa, as well as how the built environment could itself become subject to cultivation, harvest, and consumption. 
these were some of the contributors um, of the project. And I just want to read, um, I'm very close to the end, a very short passage by Mark Wigley from that series on the excremental interior. And he writes, digestion is construction, self-construction. We build ourselves from digesting the world, swallowing solids, liquids, and gases to break down and filter them, retaining materials vital for survival and expelling the rest. Sucking, breathing, digesting, and excreting are an urgently good idea from the moment the original plumbing of the umbilical cord is disconnected. In fact, digestion makes possible all the ideas that supposedly make us uniquely human. Less obviously difficult or even impossible to fully accept, the digestive system that builds us is strictly speaking not inside us. The 25 feet or so of gut that passes from mouth to anus is not really inside the body. Rather, it is the part of the outside world that passes through us. More precisely, digestion turns the outside into an inside. Our organism is never simply in the world, but an intricate folding of outside into an inside. More precisely still, it is a fold that produces the very sense of an outside by constructing an interior seemingly detached from it. So we're working, uh, this was the catalog which was uh, which is sold out, but we're working on a book that will include all of these texts and, um, and some of these projects. So I would like to end this by um, three reflections um, of, or takeaway points from Edible or the architecture of metabolism. And the first is the fragility of our production and distribution processes. Food uncertainty, the impact of the pandemic on industrial food production or events such as the Russian war against Ukraine and the energy crisis related to this, or even the blockage of the Suez Canal in March, 2021, that seized global transportation of goods creating a major impact on the international economy are all realities that foreground the urgency for a united reflection on the fragility of our production and distribution processes, the significance of the geolocation and mediums of such processes. We wonder where, where are things being produced and how they reach their final destination. But it also makes us reflect on the exaggerated lifestyles leading to ceaseless growth and endless mobility and finally, our accountability for how we occupy the planet. Moving beyond an understanding of metabolism as a collection of machines, which is a very heavy reading coming from the burden of modernism, we explored metabolism, we'd like to think so, as patterns of energy and material generation and distribution within a multiverse. This reality does not tolerate traditional dichotomies of nature, artifice, humans, non-humans, resource, and waste. Rather, it urges the emergence of a novel network of life and death and alternative forms of matter, including non-human agents. With the texts of Rosie, Rosie Braidotti, Anna Singh, Arturo Escobar on our backs, the framework of Edible opened the notion of non-human agents to include not only biological, but also technological and cultural others, while it also aimed to explore the potential of all natural and technological expressions to mitigate the contaminating and extracting nature of our desires and protocols related to the production of the built environment. The last point is that of abundance versus scarcity. A short-sighted vision of mainstream sustainability or the way at least the way in which society perceives it is the aspect that we need to compromise our needs and desires. We're asked to consume less, to build less, to generate less emissions, to move less and so on and so forth. At the same time, the global systems in place operate in a totally different mindset, that of centralization, separation between waste and valuable matter, of extractive approaches and of heavy carbonized production processes. It is important, therefore, to ask more of design, to ask more of how our byproducts are reused, 
where our resources are generated in buildings and cities, and eventually to implement new forms of localization and a paradigm that operates within a mindset of abundance, which expands the definition of resources, their location, as well as raw materials that can be found and mined. It is important to consider our built environment as a potential mine of new resources and work around the policies, technologies, and multidisciplinary teams required for the implementation of new paradigms. Because such paradigms can provide actionable areas for designers and decision makers within a regenerative world that in its turn continuously recirculates the food that is required to sustain it. And with that, I would like to thank you so much for listening.